Hey everyone, it's Helen. I'm here today with Steve Keller, um, who is a successful acquisition entrepreneur. I wanted to share his story today. Um, Steve bought two home service businesses. Uh, he leveraged an SBA loan and he was able to sell it to private equity um, and you know have a successful exit. So really excited to have Steve on today and uh, learn more about his story. Awesome. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. So Steve, um, you know, tell us a little bit more about yourself, your background. Um, where where are you from? Where do you live? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I I grew up in Northern Michigan. Um, went to Michigan State and uh, actually studied radio, TV, radio, and film there. And uh, that was my career for for ten years after I graduated. I was a uh, camera guy in sports television. Um, I did a little bit of political stuff uh, for for a political show in between, but for the most part, did sports for about ten years. And and got to experience a lot of cool things, traveled around and, and went to a bunch of, I'm a big sports guy myself. So went to a bunch of, uh, got to experience a bunch of cool sporting events, college football, NFL, um, uh, PGA tour golf, went to a couple of majors there. So got to do a bunch of cool stuff in that space. Um, and that's, you know, was, was what I went to school for and what I wanted to do. Ultimately, once I got into it, kind of realized I, I couldn't, I knew I couldn't do it forever. I did something that um, it was called steady cam, but I had my own equipment and I wore heavy, uh, I had to carry around heavy equipment that was like strapped to me. So, um, I kind of knew long-term, you know, I wasn't going to do it until <laughs> I was, you know, 40, 50, 60 years old, even though I saw guys in our industry do that. Um, it just wears down on your body and I traveled a lot. So, um, I figured throughout those 10 years, I had, I had a pretty good lifestyle with that business. I traveled, but when I wasn't traveling, I was home, not working. So, um, I probably traveled 150 days a year. So the other couple hundred wow. days a year, you know, I had a, when you're, when you're on your road, on the road and working, you're working, you're making money when you're not, you're not, you're at home. And so that's what, um, kind of, I started reading books and I started trying to do side hustles and tried to do other things. Cause I had the time and I was interested in it. And so, um, one of the first books I got my hands on was Rich Dad, Poor Dad. And uh, I was working on a political show at the time and he was a guest on our show, Robert Kiyosaki. So his book was there um, kicking myself now all these years later because I, you know, I, I probably said hi to him, but I didn't, <laughs> I didn't show his hand or anything. Um, but that's what really kind of sparked my interest in, in other things and realizing that there's a different way. Um, nobody, I didn't come from a family of entrepreneurs or business owners or anything like that. So I just was kind of fascinated by by these things. Uh, became friends with a business broker uh, throughout the years, and he kind of really opened my eyes to to buying something existing because I had tried, you know, side hustles and started various things that some went somewhere, some didn't. A lot of them were just you know complete failures and just kind of kept trying new things. Um, but I always kind of had my TV work to fall back on, right? That was my main source of income. So um, that led me down a path to just learning and trying new things. Well, then eventually when COVID happened, uh, I guess kind of a blessing in disguise for us. Um, I was on the, on the downside was out of work for TV sports shut down everywhere. So I had no work anymore. Right. And so I was like, all right, well, there goes that excuse. Um, don't have that, you know, I don't have that to fall back on. So, and, and didn't know how long it was going to last, you know, I had no clue. Right. And, and so I was like, is this going to be a week, a month, a year, 10 years? Like, what's like, what is this yeah. going to look like? So, um, and it was at the same time that we found out my wife was, uh, pregnant with our twins. And so, uh, life was coming at me real fast and I was like, well, out of a job. Uh, wife's pregnant and we got two on the way. This is crazy. Um, and so I was like, I've never been a better time to buy business than now. And so I went on the hunt and it was, uh, it, it was an awesome experience. And I was just searching for a local service-based business, um, ended up in a wild industry, which I'll, which I'll talk about, but, um, I found a small one in my, t in, in, in Dallas, Fort Worth, which is where I live now. And, um, it was the right size, the right time. It, it, it did, I'll give you some economics on it. It was doing maybe a couple hundred thousand dollars a year in revenue. And I think like $60,000 net, but it was one crew, one truck, and they did crime scene cleanup. They did like, um, biohazard cleanup after yeah. death cleanup, you know, hoarding cleanup, that type of thing. But I really liked the guy who was selling it. It was private. It wasn't a franchise. And I was like, great, I'll just buy this. I actually used, um, during COVID, they had the CARES Act and you could take borrow money out of your retirement as long as you paid it back to yourself within three years, no interest, no penalties. You know, they allowed you to basically do that. And so that's what I did. We had money in retirement accounts. So I borrowed it and I paid $120,000 for the business. 
uh, loaned myself the money, paid it back within the three years. Um, so that kind of got me on the journey. Uh, TV had come back at some point. So I was doing both of those at the same time for a little while there. Um, I went back and worked like one more full football season, college football. And then it was like the business had grown enough to where it could replace. I'd gotten it to where it was making a six figure net amount and I could kind of walk away, you know, walk away from TV. I was, I was, I made the same amount of money in TV for like 10 years. I was like a, uh, 130 to $150,000 a year guy. So I got the business up to making a little over hundred grand or somewhere, somewhere around there. It was probably wasn't equal to, but enough to where I could say, okay, I don't have to travel anymore. Let me focus on this business thing. So that's, um, it took me a couple of years to do that. And then just because I'm sure you can relate, I just, it's just kind of in my DNA. I was still looking for other opportunities and yeah. I found another one. I found a second one for sale that was listed on biz by sell. Um, and I just, I found it, it was the same industry, but it was in Florida. And so I was like, well, that's interesting. Um, much bigger, much more established. I think I sent you some of the economics on this deal. It was, um, it was doing about a million dollars in revenue. It was, I think netting like four, 450,000, wow, um, really a very, very profitable industry. Yeah. Um, and so, and it was for sale for 1.25 million. And so I had to go do SBA for that deal. Uh, it was my first time doing an SBA deal. Um, it's SBA is great, right? Uh, it was the only way that I was I was able to go buy that business. Um, but SBA is a long process, right? It's just a lot of paperwork. They want everything under the sun, but um, there's really no other way, you know, for for somebody like me in that scenario to get the debt to go buy that business. So I had the final purchase price was 1.3 million because I did buy fifty thousand dollars of her accounts receivable, and. The way I structured it was, and this was, you know, I had my my business broker buddy help me out, and the structure of the deal was key. So I got this seller to do five percent seller's note, and so the SBA required ten percent down, but they would consider her five percent seller's note as part of my down payment if she would agree to do a full standby. Which the rules have changed now. Uh, the SBA changed their rules, I think, just recently, maybe even this year or late last year, where. They only need a two-year standby. So it would have been a lot easier to convince her to do a two-year standby than a 10-year standby. But uh, but I got her to do it as part of the deal. I offered her full asking price and said, hey, look, I'm not going to – I'm going to give you what you're asking for the business, but in return, I want a 5% seller's note. It's just not a huge amount of money, right? But – you know, the still standby gonna, was probably the the, the standby is the hardest part, right? Yeah, and so her hope was that I refinanced or I sold it or something before, which ultimately I did, and that which is kind of the crazier part of the story. But I got her to do five percent, so five percent was there, and then my brother, uh, I got my brother in on the deal. I sold him five percent of the company uh, for the other for the other five percent. So that was my whole ten percent. I had to bring because there was uh, working capital and and like guarantee fees from the SBA and those other things. I had to bring uh, twenty thousand dollars of my own cash to closing. So I bought a $1.2 million business or $1.3 million business for $20,000 $20, out of my pocket. Um, now I had the experience because I had bought the smaller one. So it was easy for me to explain like, well, hey, why you know, why should you buy a, a business in another state? The SBA is not huge on like absentee ownership. And so I had to convince them like, hey, look, I'm going to travel back and forth a little bit or enough, but I'm going to operate it the same way I operate my business here. And I, I'm not out in the field doing doing the jobs. It's you know more of an executive management uh, ownership. I'm, I'm worried about marketing. I'm worried about, um, you know, hiring and, and, and retaining good employees and those types of things. And I had already owned one for a couple of years. So I had to say, Hey, like it's the same exact industry I'm already in. And, and I knew that, um, it was going to be a good opportunity. So I ended up closing on that. And then, um, the wild thing, something wild happened. I caught lightning in a bottle. Number one, I found a really good deal. So it was out there on the market. It was available. Number two, I realized during due diligence that they had, um, we're, we're pretty significantly underbilling uh, insurance for, and that's that was the primary like big ticket deal was we could bill homeowners insurance for for the cleanup stuff that we did, and I, I so I during due diligence got some of their some of their invoices and asked for them and was like holy smokes, this is an interesting and you never really know like I was like I don't know maybe the maybe the rules in Florida are different maybe and I. Okay. I I had talked to my third party billing company and they were like, no, nah, man, we, we've got clients there that are billing the same that we're billing for you in Dallas, Fort Worth. And I said, okay, maybe that'll be the first thing that I fix when I, when I take ownership of it. So, um, sure enough, I went into the, to the, to the office of the, of the young woman who did our billing right after I bought it. And I sat down with her and I said, all right, show me, you know, the very first job that we had after I bought it. I was like, walk me through our invoice that we're building. 
And she kind of went through and I was like, okay, we're going to make a change and we're going to do this right. Um, they were just leaving a bunch of money on the table. They weren't billing properly, um, but they'd been in business for 20 years. And so they had increased their pricing over time, but the industry just kind of, you know, their fear was if they build too much, they would have a harder time collecting and, you know, legitimate reasons, but I had already been doing it in my other business. And so I was like, oh, I don't know, we're, we're not even close to billing like on par with other people. Like we were never the highest. We never took advantage, but I was like, I'm billing what other people are billing in this industry. And that's all we did. We changed that. We took out a couple of line items that they always got pushed back on. And so now we're charging way more. Uh, the, the insurance companies are approving them a lot faster. Um, and because we took out a couple of like you know, line items that they always had pushed back on. And so like overnight, our business was, um, they were under billing by like 60, 65% compared wow. to what we were. So we more than, you know, I mean, everything just overnight went crazy. Um, and we're collecting cash and it's coming in. And so things are, I was like, wow, this is awesome. Right. We fixed this thing. And, and, uh, at the same time we were doing more jobs than they had ever done. Um, so they, they had a really good referral set up for their business and that's how they got all their jobs. And that's what I wanted to learn so that I could implement it in my, in my business in, in Texas. Um, and so things happened really fast. And I, I had, there was another business I was looking at buying another one, at, like up in uh, Birmingham, Alabama area, I think, um, same, same, space. In, same industry had talked to the guy and he was like, Hey man, look, it's under LOI, but I'm selling to somebody that I don't really know if I want to sell to. And I was like, okay, I, I knew exactly who he was talking about right away. It was the big player in our space. And I was like, all right, well, let me know what happens. Like I just did an SBA deal. I probably, you know, I don't know what it was. It was just a little bit smaller of a deal, but um, still it was actually geographically located really well. Cause we had Florida and then would have been up, up to, up to Alabama. So there'd have been some, some good stuff going on there, but ultimately he decided to sell. Um, and he sold the private equity, the same company that I ultimately ended up selling to. And so I said, well, tell me about that. How did that go? And, and what did you feel about it? And he just, he's like, man, the process went really well. It had a lot of positive things to say to me about it. And I said, you know, would you mind connecting me with them maybe in a year or two years or something after I kind of, you know, get a couple years of tax returns. And he was like, yeah, absolutely. I think you should talk to him in a year. And I said, he's like, I kind of explained to him what we did. We changed our billing around and he was like, yeah, get, you know, get a year's worth of those financials and then have a conversation. Well, it was at this time I was looking for a uh, new real estate. I was leasing. We were in the same space that they had operated out of, but the, the people I bought from owned that building and they, and they officed out of there for some other businesses too. And so it was kind of no, like known, Hey, I'll probably move this at some point. So I was looking at different places in town uh, to move it to. And I was staring down, you know, the barrel of a, five, six, seven year lease and, and, and committing to that. And, and so I went back to my buddy and I was like, Hey, the guy I knew that sold. And I said, should I sign a long-term lease? Like, will they, will they need my space? Will they just absorb me? Like how, how would this work? And he was like, man, I don't know. He's like, I wouldn't sign a lease right now. He's like, let's have, let me introduce you to him and have the conversation now. And I was like, okay, I'll always have the conversation. So he connected me with the private equity company and they were very, very, very interested uh, in, in buying us out. And I was like, look, I just got this thing. We just changed the financials of it overnight. And I would love to sell it in a couple of years, but here's here's what we're doing. And here's what I'm going to look to sell it for in a couple of years. If you can come close to that, I know I'm going to leave some money on the table because you guys are going to take a risk as well. Um, but that would be the only the only way, right? Like if you just offered me an amount I couldn't turn down. And they were like, look, we really think we can offer you something that you're going to entertain. And I said, okay. So gave them some basic information, some financials, right? We went back and forth. And I was probably a couple of weeks later. At this point, I'd only owned the business for maybe a few months, maybe like wow. three months, maybe like three months, like probably a one quarter in. And things were going great. We were breaking sales records every month. We were obviously billing way more than we'd ever billed. And cash was now starting to come in because I'm 90 days into it and the collections have all started to catch up. So we're flush with cash. Things are going great. Like no, you shouldn't sell. I mean, typically wouldn't yeah. sell in that scenario. Um, but of course they come to the table. They're the big, they're the big player in the space. They're private equity. They've got enough money and, the, and, and I, I'm such a small deal to them, right? Like they typically go out and buy like an entire franchise company, right? Like they'll go out and buy like a big, a big you know organization for, for hundreds of millions of dollars. And so my deal was, was, was nothing to them, um, but but big to me. So they came they came to the table and they gave me a really good offer. And uh, so their initial offer they came to me with was like, um, 
five and a half million for the business that I had just bought for 1.3. Wow. I was like, okay, but they wanted to buy both. And so I was like, they're like, what's the other one worth? And I was like, um, I don't know, probably 350,000. They're like, all right, well, we'll offer you 350 for that one too. And I was like, okay, I should have said 500,000. Um, and so all in all, they wanted me to do, but they wanted me to do a million dollar earnout. And I was like, no way, no chance. Like if you want this thing right now and you, and I know you want it right now, I do not want to do earnout. I want all cash at closing. I mean, it, they, you know, if they want to do some sort of small hold back, which they did. And I can, I'll, I'll kind of tell you about that part of the deal, but they were like, okay. And I was like, but I only want to sell the, the, the Florida business. I don't want to sell the Texas one. I want to grow it. Now that I know what I know, let me go implement that there and then build that up for a couple of years and, and sell that off. Well, they didn't want that. And so they were like, all right, if you're willing to sell both of us, sell them both to us, then, then we'll do all cash at closing for the price that we set. <laughs> and they're like, would you do that deal? And I said, yeah, I'd probably do that deal. So, um, so they got rid of the earnout. Five and a half million for the for the one business, three fifty for the other one, and then they bought almost three hundred thousand dollars of our accounts receivable for the for the Florida business because our our billing was so yeah. we were doing so many jobs and we had a backlog. Um, so it was like six point six point one or six point one five or something was the total deal, and then they did do a seventy five thousand dollar escrow. Yeah, that was just for unforeseen, you know whatever billing issues that they had. Maybe they had issues collecting the AR or maybe some unforeseen, you know, it was just a hold back. It's still there. I'm, um, I won't get that until the middle of this year, but they have not used it for anything. So it's just kind of sitting there in an escrow account. Um, and yeah, so after the, after we did the LOI and we agreed on it, I think we closed it in like 45 days or 60 days. Or wow. something. It was fast. I mean, they still needed everything. Right. But the nice part was there was no bank. You know, there's, so there's no SBA to deal with. There's nothing like that. It was just them asking for everything under the sun. And, and it was hard because I had to keep it a secret from, from employees and certain things. Like my GM who was running my Florida business, I, I, she had known about it. Cause I was like, look, I'm going to need your help doing this. And, um, and I had just met her, uh, which is interesting, but she was, she was awesome. Um, and I took care of her after this, after the sale, but, um, so yeah, so we, it, it just, I, I couldn't believe that it all happened. Um, and so, yeah, we closed on it um, at the end of May last year and um, yeah, they bought both businesses and and took them over and did their thing. They had no need for me. You know, they were such a big entity that they owned the biggest player in, in that, in that space. And that's who they rolled us up under, but they were actively trying aggressively, actively going out and, and buying up, you know, good shops around the country. And um yeah, it was a no brainer for me. Right. Like, I mean, what am I going to do? You know, I, I talked to my CPA, I talked to my attorney, I talked to my business mentor friends, obviously my wife and other people. And I mean, the general consensus was like, you know, we'd have to check your head if you didn't take this deal. Um, because how, I mean, how often is that ever going to happen? You know, yeah. uh, where, where you were able to turn around and sell a business like that. So I, I knew that I got a little lucky, but I think, you know, for, for your audience and, and, and the stuff that I've, I've followed, you know, on your socials and what you, what you're teaching, um, is, you know, stuff like that's not possible unless you're in the game, unless you, yeah. unless, unless you own something like those, then, then crazy stuff can happen. And, and it's not always going to work out that, you know, you flip your business for four times what you bought it for in a few months. Um, you know, I, I, I bought the smaller one for one twenty and sold it for three fifty. you know, a few years later. So I made a nice little, um, uh, exit there as well. But yeah, the other one was, was, you know, more life-changing as far as, as far as the amount of capital. And, um, yeah, so it just, it's just wild. It's crazy. It opened my eyes to so many different things. And now I'm, now I'm onto my next adventure. I, you know, I spent the last nine months or so just, um, enjoying, uh, kind of a midlife retirement, I guess. Uh, I'm, I'm 36 years old now. So I, I knew that I wasn't, you know, I couldn't retire. Um, not quite be. midlife. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, so, um, I just, uh, enjoyed the time off, you know, we, we bought a new house, we got a, a bigger house on a little bit more property and, uh, spent some fun time with the kids and they're, they're three, three years old now. And, um, so it was kind of cool from, you know, from two to three, I got to uh, spend a lot of time with them and, and it's just a fun, a fun time for them and a fun time for us. I was here able to be around, you know, for, for bath nights and all that, all that fun stuff that you just, you know, I wasn't, I wasn't grinding away working too hard. And so now, now I can, I can get back to work a little bit, uh, but I just have so much more flexibility now with, with what types of deals I want to get into, how involved I want to be. And, um, 
yeah, things change a little bit when you've got capital because now I can invest in different opportunities and now I can really kind of play a little bit of a different game and see, see what we can do next. So that was, that was the, the wild story that, um, I still don't really understand how it all happened, but, uh, it did and it's possible. And, um, I don't have a finance degree. Um, I was a camera guy just a few years ago. Um, and I, and nothing against camera guys. I love them. I have a lot of friends that are still camera guys, but, uh, you know, we're, we're not, we're not, uh, we didn't go to business school and, and those types of things. So I, I had to learn, you know, my business degree was buying and selling two companies. Yeah. That's where I learned business was just in it. Um, in, in basic things, you know, uh, treating people well, you know, treating your employees well. Um, I think the general consensus was people liked working for me. I think they were a little upset that I sold the companies, uh, which is, you know, it comes with the territory. You know, I had to deal with that. People probably have a sour taste in their mouth about me, some of them. Um, but you know, the decision I made was, was for the best of my family and myself. And, I'm the one who personally guaranteed a $1.3 million loan, took on the debt, took on the risk. So yeah. I, when you do that, you get, you have the opportunity to make the other decisions that are in your best interest. Um, when you yeah. take on all, when you take on all the risk. So, um, but, uh, in, in doing the right thing for customers, like it's the reason I like service business is because, you know, your competitors are not typically the most sophisticated. So if you do basic things, right, like answer the phones, and shoot them a text when you're on the way and, and have good, decent communication with them. Do what you say you're going to do. Fix a mistake. If you make a mistake, like it's not rocket science, um, it's small business, you know, but it's all about the people. And, and we had good staff in both locations, um, that made the whole thing go. Um, and so I'm taking what I've learned from this experience and hopefully, you know, be able to learn and do, do something cool in the, in the next deal, um, which we can talk about if you want to. Yeah, no, I mean, Thank you. What a wild story. Congratulations. Yeah. I mean, Thanks. that's a crazy story. I have a bunch of questions. I guess even going back to sort of like the very early days, how did you pick the industry, you know, you went for? Was it kind of random? Did you like, were there certain you know elements you were looking for? Or like, what did that look like? I wanted service um, because I I had home service. I kind of, I kind of understood what it was about. And my, my business broker buddy was like, buy a home service company. And I was like, okay. So, I, and I got some advice. I was like, Hey, go look for a home service company. So I was looking for a home service company of a certain size that kind of fit these other criteria. And that first business fit these other things. It just happened to be that the service that they offered was crime scene cleanup. And I had heard about the industry a little bit. And the more I learned about it, I was like, okay, this is wild and crazy. Saw some unbelievably wild and crazy stuff. And it's, it's tough, right? It's, it's a real industry. It's, it's after death cleanup, right? Like for the most part. Um, and, and hoarding is a very, very tough thing to deal with too. You know, um, it presents a bunch of challenges and, and it's, look, it's tough for the people who, who worked for us that had to go out and clean up after tragedy after tragedy. Right. Um, but it's a necessary service. It's, it's something that people need. And, um, my whole goal was to say, look, when, when people are in a time of need for this type of service. Hopefully they trust us to come do the job and we take, we take good care of them. So yeah, it was when I learned the, the economics of it, um, that was the exciting part, right? Like it's hard to get excited about an industry that's centered around death. Right. But when you look at it from a business perspective, um, very high ticket insurance paid jobs, very high margin, and service, right? There's not a ton of cogs related. There's not a ton of overhead. I didn't have, you know, in in Florida, I had a space. In Dallas, we operated out of a storage unit with we ended up having two trucks eventually, but one to two trucks and a couple of crews who didn't have to come into an office. We just dispatched, right? So it was all about just get generating business, generating leads, getting the phone to ring, answering, dispatching, and, and going and performing jobs, and then obviously billing and everything on the back end. But um what did so, what did your what did your role look like? You know, early on, um, was this what was the transition like when you bought the first business and and the second business? I guess. Yeah, um, I'm, I was always a marketing, making sure like uh, my my job was to make sure that we got the phones to ring and what did what what were we doing there? So trying different marketing tactics, which was different in Dallas and it wasn't in, in Florida because in Dallas we didn't have a huge referral base. Um, we hadn't been around that long because when I bought it, it was only a couple years old and pretty small. So we relied heavily on, you know, organic Google traffic, paid Google traffic and other types of, you know, online marketing things that we kind of had to try, you know, 
throwing, throwing it at the wall and seeing what sticks type of thing. Um, and then he had some relationships with like apartment complexes in those, um, cause you get business from them as well. And it's usually repeat, you know, you get, you get a good relationship with, uh, with the property manager. And then anytime they have, a any sort of bad stuff happen at their property, they just know to call you. Um, so that was always kind of the role. Um, I did a lot of the back end, like billing stuff as well. And so, which really was, I, I hired a lot of, I, this is business advice I got from a, a good friend of mine. And he said, when you can hire vendors and as opposed to an employee in any scenario that you can, that makes sense because it's so much easier to deal with a vendor than it is an employee because the vendors that you hire have employees and then they manage those employees, not to manage them. You just have to manage the vendor. And so I had vendors for phones, you know, all my phones were answered by a third party vendor. I didn't have an in-house, you know, team answering phones. Wow. I had, um, and my billing was outsourced too. So I used a third party billing company. So whenever we did complete a job, I'd get the information from the crew. I would package that up and, and send that off to the third party. And then they would contact the insurance companies on our behalf, go back and forth, negotiate and get it paid. And then I would pay them a, a, a percentage fee of whatever they helped me collect. Um, and they Smart. built the invoices the right way, you know, the way the, the industry is supposed to. Yeah. It was, it was easy, easy for me to, to justify paying them, you know, what we, and it, it wasn't inexpensive, right? The, the bills are high. Um, and so, and they're getting a piece of every bill. It wasn't like, Hey, we're going to do this for $250 per invoice. It was like, you know, a lot of the invoices were paying them thousands of dollars because they're collecting sometimes tens of thousands of dollars for us. Yeah. Um, and, and then were the sellers, were the sellers continuing to stay involved after you guys bought the business? Were, were they the first one? Yeah. Owners? The first oh, one was okay. a, was a younger, I mean, involved he, him and I become friends. So he, he's, um, very similar age to me. We both play golf. So we've, we've kept in touch over the years and he, he was just available to me, um, way more than we even agreed in the APA. Right. Um, and so involved meaning it, he helped me close my first job, you know, over the phone before I had hired, hired the answering service. And so, and he stuck around now he moved to Hawaii cause that was why he sold it. He wanted to move to Hawaii. Um, so there was a little bit of a time difference there, but I still, uh, still kept in touch with them. So anything I needed emails, phone calls, I could, I could contact him and say, Hey, what uh, I encountered something I never encountered before. What do I do? Um, and so he, but he was super helpful for, for, for years beyond. And then oh, when wow. I bought the, when I, even when I bought the second company, he always kept in touch and, um, and we still keep in touch to this day. And, um, with the second business, uh, it was a little bit different cause it was in a state that I didn't live, but there was a, like a kind of a business operations manager role that was there that somebody was already in. And I kind of asked during due diligence when we were, when I was buying that, Hey, do you think that person could be like a GM and could like run the show? Right. And they were like, yeah, we, we totally think so. You know, obviously it's going to be your call, but, and she was awesome. And so as soon as I got there, I immediately was like, Hey, nice to meet you. You're here's the keys to the car. And I, so she ran the day to day and she already pretty much did, but she over, she helped me oversee everything. So boots on the ground in the office every day. So I would just talk to her a lot. I mean, her and I would have multiple phone calls a day, especially those first few months. Um, and I, I went to Florida probably three or four times. And those, and those, you know, that as soon as I bought it, obviously went there, stayed for a week, came home, went there probably like 30 days later, checking in on everybody, seeing how things are going. And then maybe went one, one or two more times. Um, and then the last couple of times I went was, was meeting with, you know, private equity and, and, uh, getting our deal done basically. But, um, so that was, that was a, a pretty semi absentee business, right? Like they had everything. It, it was one of those businesses where, and that's, what's, that's what you get when you buy a bigger business, right? They had way more infrastructure, even they're still a small company, maybe six, seven employees, something like that. But um, they had six, seven employees at least, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Like, yeah, my first one was like one employee and I, and I had to hire somebody new because I knew he was leaving and and finally found a couple of really good employees that stuck, but it took me a little while where this one was like, everything's staffed, everything's good to go. And they were already, everything was humming along. And it was like, um, really just don't mess it up. You know, like, Hey, just look, you got the, the reason this business is, is awesome is because of you guys. I'm not going to come in here and change my, change the billing structure, but I didn't change any of the, like de whatever systems they use, we kept, you know, even if I had different systems with my other business, I didn't want to come in and, you know, you obviously don't want to change a bunch of stuff too fast for sure, or change anything at all for the first 90 days. Um, except for the billing it was like, Hey, we're going to do the same thing we're doing. We're going to bill more. And everybody's like, yeah. okay, we don't think that's going to work. And I was like, it's going to work. I promise. Um, and so that was, you know, that was really just, 
some high level decision making. Again, marketing where you know where we let's try some different marketing that they didn't do, um, but they had really really good referral sources and and trying to understand and learn how they did their how they did their their sales process and how they got those referrals was was big. Um, did you integrate but, the two businesses at all or was it? No, not really. Um, uh, I, I learned, you know, so I could kind of, you know, my smaller business here was like, how many, how many jobs are they doing? I'm like, I know that's crazy. They're busy. We, we need to learn what they're doing so that we can be that busy here. Um, but yeah, I mean, I had plans to, right. Like I had plans to have everybody come or, or, you know, or us go there just to learn some things or you could do some cross training type stuff. Um, I just didn't own it for long enough for any of that stuff to come yeah. to fruition, but um, so no, they were pretty much two separate entities that just, that learned from each other. Cause even the smaller one, you know, did things a little bit better than the bigger one and vice versa. So we could kind yeah. of learn and share those, Hey, look, this is what's going really well over here. Let's do that in this business and vice versa. So we shared some resources that way, but, um, otherwise it was just, and I had, I had, it's funny because that was kind of my whole goal is like, Hey, just don't mess this up. Like, let's just keep their, let's just keep this train rolling down the tracks. Cause they're doing really well. And I don't want to mess that up. And I met with one of the uh, referral, big referral sources. So they got a lot of referrals from like law enforcement and stuff. Um, and we were out doing one of our sales activities. So I went with a sales rep at the time and just got to kind of see one of these activities in person and like the chief officer, what I, you know, whoever it was like the head guy at, at whatever police department that we were at came up to me and he was like, so you're the, you're the new owner, right? Said, yeah. He goes, don't mess this up. He's like, all you have to do is not mess it up. He's like, we've been working with them for a really long time. Like, just don't mess it up. And I was like, okay, sounds good. You know? Uh, so, and that's what you hope for, right? You hope you buy yeah. something that it's like, Hey, look, it's so good. You just, you know, you're buying an existing cash flowing business. Um, that's ideally what you should be getting. And I, I was, I was big on buying on market, good businesses versus, you know, there's some other folks in the space, um, uh, that come to mind, Cody Sanchez, Carl Allen, they have some different types of stuff that, you know, they're, they're big on off market deals, or maybe they're big on finding something that's like, Oh, it's going to close. Let's, let's go buy it and fix it. And I was like, I didn't want to fix her upper, you know what I mean? I wanted to buy a, an easy, an easy business and no business is easy and none of it was easy, but it was a good business that I paid full market price for. And I'm happy to do that and go take out the debt to do so because I don't have to come in and be like, well, I've got the magic sauce to fix everything. Um, I just wanted to come in and take over what they had already done that was really good and see if I could make marginal increments in certain areas, right? Um, even if it's just a fresh set of eyes on something, yeah. um, like my eyes on their billing and being like, we need, we need to fix that. It just was nice that there was a lot more juice there. Um, it would have been a lot different if they were already billing, but I would have had to pay a lot more for that business if they were already billing right too because their business would have been worth would have been worth way more. So that, that part of it worked out in my favor for sure. How did you, um, how did you incentivize the previous, um, I guess, business operations person, um, you know, when you promoted her to GM, you know, how did you incentivize her to really, you know, run the show for you? Well, she um, wanted to, huge. yeah, she really wanted to run the show. She wanted the previous owner to hand over the keys, but they, they didn't want to give up too much control. I think and they had been in business for 20 years, you know, so yeah. some, some of that comes with that territory. Um, uh, I, I paid her more, yeah. you know, immediately gave her a raise paid, you know, she wasn't, she wasn't necessarily being like way underpaid or anything, but for what she was doing, like she, you know, so, um, I paid her considerably more and, um, I did give her some incentives, some like profit share incentives, which again, never really materialized. But then, you know, when I was going to sell the business, I said, look, if we can, if you can help me make this happen, because I'm going to need your help to do it as far as getting information and getting financials without everybody finding out so I can provide all the stuff that they're asking for. Um, I'll make sure that you're compensated on the way yeah. out. So, so I did that too. So she kind of knew, um, and she didn't really know what was going to happen afterwards. You know, was she going to stick around Were they not, were they going to want her or not want her? So, um, but she was, she was more than happy to, to kind of help me. But yeah, at first, the way that I incentivized her was like, Hey, you're going to have, you're going to have the roles and responsibilities that you want. She really, really liked the business. She really liked the people that were there. And so she's like, I want to take over this business and be the, be the person who's running the day-to-day -day show. Right. But she also wanted to make more money, you know? And yeah. so I was like, perfect. You know, there was enough room and enough profit in the business to be able to do that. And that's another nice thing about having a higher margin service business like that was there was juice there to, to pay, you know, I'm, I'm making less profit because I got to pay her, you know, considerably more, but so worth it. Right. In the yeah. long run, no, no brainer um, to do. And I, and I gave a couple of other people raises too, you know, just made sure that everybody was happy and like, Hey, look, I, I know I'm the new guy and I know just bought this business. Things are like everybody just found out in one day and they're like, who the heck is this guy that we don't, that yeah. we never met before. And, um, 
So I just wanted to make sure that everybody knew, Hey, look, I want to make sure everybody's appreciated. And yeah, you know, you kind of, kind of some of those things that you almost anticipate doing to make sure everybody's happy and, and we're all going in the same direction together. So. No, that's, that's super smart. I guess in terms of, you know, if you had advice for someone, you know, buying their first business, would you say, you know, buy a smaller business like you did initially, or would you say, just go for a bigger business that has more, more of an infrastructure and team in place? What, what would you, what would you recommend? It's hard. I've, 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 I've been asked this question before. Um, there's not, there's definitely not one right answer. I will say a couple of things though. The second business was much easier. Yeah. but it was much more risk. So it's it's like, would I have taken on that big of a loan in an industry that I didn't know enough about if I hadn't done the first one? I don't think they would have sold me that business. I don't think the owners would have had I had not other experience too. So this, this specific example, kind of hard. Um, I typically tell people to buy bigger. That's my general advice. The bigger, if you, like you're going to take a risk regardless. And so- it just, it just, it's hard. It's hard because it, it, it depends on what your previous ex experience is, but the bigger you buy, we've already talked about more infrastructure, probably more tenured employees, probably smoother operations, yeah. gotten past a lot of the hardest parts of business where if you're buying something smaller, it's almost like you're still doing a startup, but that's just got a little bit of a head start. So that's what my first business was. It was a startup, but it had a little bit of a head start. So it was easier to, to, to yeah. continue on. And the second one was just, crew, let's just keep doing what we're doing and yeah. less, less things to figure out and less things to solve. So I think my general advice is bigger, typically better. Um, but it all depends. There's, there's a lot of factors that go into it and the way that I went about it, it worked out. Um, it, but at the end of the day, it's all about risk analysis. You know, I hear a lot of people say, well, I'm just, I have too much fear. I can't get past the fear of, you know, quitting my job or doing this or doing that. And, you know, I, I try to tell people like, well, number one, you know, fear is the human response, emotional response to risk. So let's yeah. look at the risk instead, right? Fear is just your emotional response to it. And we can't make decisions based off of, off, those, of the, off that emotional response. So let's look at at the risk factor of it. And when you start looking at the risks associated, it usually kind of steers you in a direction that is the best decision. And sometimes you find out, yeah, this is too risky and I shouldn't do this. Or you find out for me, it was like, what's the worst thing that happens? I got to go back and work in TV. I've been doing that for 10 years. Yeah. That seems, I mean, okay, fine. I can go do that. Um, or, or vice versa. If you have a W2 job and it's like, do you think in a couple of years, if you quit your job and you bought a business and it didn't work out that you could go get a job again? And if the answer is yes, and it typically is because they're usually, you know, been successful in their careers. Um, then that's the worst thing that can happen. And when your back's up against the wall and you don't want that to happen, you'll do pretty much whatever it takes to make it a success. And that's, you know, almost another one of those things where it's like, that's why buying a bigger business, if, if it makes sense. Like I wouldn't tell somebody who's, you know, this is their last stitch effort, right. To go, to go spend 50 grand, you know, cash down on and buy a, you know, million and a half dollar business or a million dollar business, whatever it is, but you can structure it in, in, in different ways. And like, look, I've also heard from SBA, some SBA lenders that number one, the government backs the loan for the bank, right? Yeah. And they, they back like 75%. 75%, yeah. And the other 25 is the risk to the bank. But I, I don't even know if that bank's going to come after you for the 25%. Like, I, I'm not really sure. Um, I know there's a personal guarantee there. I just... I don't know how often it is that you're going to be like on the hook for the, you know, for the entire amount. Well, I know you wouldn't be on the hook for the 75% from the government. Cause I don't think the government comes after you for that. I think that's just their guarantee as part of the deal. Um, don't quote me on that. I've heard, I've heard a couple of different things from different lenders, but I think there's the risk profile is a little bit different than you would assume when you're personally guaranteeing a million dollar loan, let's say. Um, but, but you know, you can't, I mean, you can't do the same thing over and over again and expect different results. You can't, you know, like, well, I really want to do this. Well, you know, you know, things aren't going to change in your life, but I agree. And a lot of the stuff that I've seen that you have, the information that you have is, you know, one of the fastest ways to get to a half a million dollars is to buy a business. I 100% agree with that. And, you know, I, I've, I've seen your ads and I've seen some of the stuff you post, like $50,000 down can buy you $250,000 of cash flow in a business, 100%. You know, I, I, I had $20,000 down 
I bought me 450 of cash flow, less the debt service, which is probably about $200,000 a year. So, you know, I spent 20 grand to get a couple hundred thousand dollars of actual cash flow after debt service. Um, that's a pretty good it's deal. Definitely possible. Yeah, definitely possible. What, <laughs> what's your perspective? Yeah, what's your perspective on the SBA loan? I guess as a whole, you know, do you recommend people go down that path? Um, you know, a lot of people are sort of like, you know, is that right for me? Um, I, yeah. My perspective is there aren't a ton of other options. No, yeah, I, I, yeah. That what's your other option? That that would be my question. You know, raising raising capital would be one option. You, you could have investors you kind of dilute your you know your equity. Um, I think the SBA is the best way to go because you can go get you know, loans for 10% down, or in a lot of cases, a, a lot less down. Like I raised 5%, um, you know, from somebody and my, it was a great deal for my brother. I mean, yeah. you know, <laughs> yeah, he, he did the same thing as me. He, he, he forexed his money in a very short amount of time too. Um, so yeah, I, I think the SBA is great. I think it's in, in the way that I look at the SBA is now, right. I had $5 million. We each have $5 million of, of debt. That you know, and, and the SBA is not always gonna, or, or our bank's not always gonna lend you money for any business, right? There's certain things that have to, you know, you still have to yeah. qualify, you still have to have some sort of, you know, relatable, relevant experience. Like, you know, there's still some things you have to do. But the way that I look at it now is I've got a rolling $5 million of debt available to me. And I used that, I paid it off. Obviously, it got, it got paid off when I sold my business, businesses. Um, and so now my, now I've got 5 million again, and I'm gonna go out and, you know, my next deal is, is, is retail mattress franchise, but I'm starting with three of those and, um, I'm going to go use, you know, the available debt that I have available to me, which is, which is 5 million. And if, when I start to think about it that way, if I'm not using it, I'm like, Matt, like, why wouldn't I be leveraging, to think about it? Yeah. Why wouldn't I be leveraging this 5 million? If somebody's got $5 million they want to give me. Why on earth, you know, what I not want to go try and figure out what I need to do that. And, and of course it, it, you have to have some cash for a down payment. Typically yeah. you have to have some other things, right? So it's not like, you know, no, not, no, it's not the right fit for every single person. Um, but I think the vast majority of people who, who say, man, I want to go buy a business, you know, especially if they're like corporate and they've got C-level experience or, you know, whatever, there's a lot of, there's a lot of people that are, are far more qualified to do what I did than me, you know? Um, so it's like, I, that's why I like sharing the story. Cause it's like, look, I was on the phone with with these guys from the private equity company. They all got finance degrees. They've all got all this stuff. And I was sitting, I remember sitting on a Zoom call with them when they were like, okay, so tell us how you 4X the value of this company in three months. And I was like, look, guys, I'm going to blow your mind. I just charged more. Like I didn't do really anything. I'm not that smart. It's really the very simple thing. And then they were like, how did you buy it? And I explained my deal structure. And they're like, so you bought this business for 20 grand out of pocket? And they were already knew what they were, you know, what they were going to yeah. offer me an idea. And they were like, <laughs> they like laughed. It's like, good for you, man. I was like, oh, thanks. Um, like I, it, it was a, it was a zoom call. I didn't feel like I had any business being on because these guys are way smarter than me. Right. Like from a, from a business financial, you know, background. And that's what they, that's what they have education on. Um, but I left that meeting going, ah, well, I guess if somebody like me can do it um, and figure it out, but look, I, I spent the better part of 10 years when I was a camera guy, uh, trying stuff, reading books, uh, going and I would drive, I would drive 45 minutes one way, hour and a half round trip to meet up with other like-minded people to play Robert Kiyosaki's cash flow board game when wow. I was in my, when I was in my twenties, you know, and I still like, you know, I still did other stuff, right? Like I still hung out with my friends. I still, you know, uh, went up, went out to the bars and went out to eat. And like, I wasn't just you know, a complete nerd, but I would think I, I was nerdy on the things that I needed to be. It was like, I need to educate myself financially and understand how money works better. Cause we don't teach that at all. And, um, unless you go get a finance degree or something like that, you know, we, they don't teach it in high school or any, any relevant, totally. you know, experience anywhere. Yeah. Um, I learned all on the fly, you know, as much as I could beforehand. And then it was like, all right, I can spend my whole life trying to learn and get ready or, I can take a calculated risk, financial risk, and bet on myself, which is what I'd done my whole career anyway. And I was like, I'll just bet on myself again. And yeah, it, it could have went a different way. Like it could have been a complete flop, but I've got a list of, this is one thing I always like to share. I've got a list of things that I tried to start that all not necessarily failed, but never, I never exited them. Yep. And I never, never really, you know, some of them made money. Some of them lost money. Some of them never got any. I start. I tried to start an apparel company. I still have the shirt to this day. It never went here. I don't think, I don't think I sold one shirt, but I had, I had like examples printed. <laughs> so I, I wear it. I'm like, this is my, this is one of my failures. Um, 
this company stunk. I never got anywhere with it. I whiffed. But all those things were things that I tried to start. And the two successful things that I've done were two businesses that I bought. So um, it just goes Wow, to, look at all the balloons that just yeah, popped up. <laughs> I, I know. <laughs> did you do that or did it just happen? No, 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 no. Zoom just does it now. That's hilarious. Um, um, so yeah, it no, was, that's, I mean, look, I, I, exact same for me, right? I have a whole list of businesses um, that I've started. I, I I was lucky that, you know, I had one business I was able to grow and sell, but it's, it's, it's challenging. The zero to one, the, it's, it's very hard. Yeah, it is. It is. I mean, and that's, that's the whole reason of buying, of buying it and, and, and understanding leverage and over, understanding debt and understanding the difference between good debt and bad debt. Like all the basic stuff that now is basic stuff to me that I learned by reading Robert Kiyosaki books and by reading, you know, like, look, Dave Ramsey says some, some like, very small things that are are worth listening to. But then a lot of the other stuff that he preaches is like, I'm like, oh my gosh, dude, if you just listen to Dave Ramsey, you know, uh, yes, spend less money than you make. You don't need to listen to Dave Ramsey to tell you that. Okay. <laughs> but, you know, open your, open your eyes and your mind and read other books and you don't even have to agree with them, you know, uh, but just read, see what else is out there. See what other people are saying about these things, uh, whether it's Robert Kiyosaki, there's plenty of business books out there. But I mean, I started with Rich Dad, Poor Dad, and, and it opened my eyes and I played the cash flow board game and I still have the board game, you know, like the digital version of it on my iPad that I play every once in a while. And, and it, you know, that game just taught me how to think about things differently, which is why it's the way I think about the, the $5 million that I have and that you have, and that everybody else has. Every yep. single one of us has $5 million available to us. And most people have no clue that that is even available. 5 million bucks. Yeah. You know, no, you know, seriously. You know no, stuff people, you people often, I mean, you've seen this, right? Like so many people don't even believe me when I tell them that. It's just like, it's true. <laughs> yeah. Oh, no, my, one of my favorite things is to see things that you post, like your ads or whatever, and then go read people's comments. Oh, yeah. Uh, it's funny. It's funny to see, uh, which, you know, look, I, I understand people are skeptics. There's a lot of people out there selling a bag of, you know, crap too. Um, or teaching stuff that's just like, but yeah, this is, look, can you go buy cash flowing businesses with SBA debt and a little bit of your own capital? 100%. And it's even easier if you've got, you know, retirement money and stuff like that. And then and that really freaks people out, right? Yeah. Like, oh, I can't use my retirement money. It's like, all right, well, just let it ride. And then if, you know, if the stock market crashes and, then, and half of your money goes away because it's just sitting in a 401k, then that's not very good either. Um the nice but thing I, about going SBA too, in my perspective is, you know, the bank's underwriting the deal. Like they're doing a lot of work for you. Um, 100%. That was one of the biggest reasons I wanted to use the SBA. Cause I was like, if they don't want to do this deal, I definitely shouldn't do this deal <laughs> because the amount of stuff that they look at between you and the buy side, the sell side, the financials, like all that stuff. I mean, they vet, they almost vet a deal for you. Now they want to, you know, they, they want to do deals, but it's not in their best interest to do a deal that's going to go south because they still have exposure. They still have risks yeah. and banks don't like exposure and risk. You know, everything's usually stacked in their favor. Um, so I agree. I think that's a very, um, a, a topic or like a, a, an aspect to it that most people don't think of. Yeah. And, and they really, they really helped me vet the deal. And, and they, they will look at every deal the same way. So, um, and I'm using SBA to, uh, you know, I'm, I'm going against my philosophy a little bit in, in, in doing a franchise, which is a startup, uh, versus buying an existing business for my next deal. But, um, I'm still using the SBA to do it, you know? Yeah. So, uh, 100%. And I knew that that was going to be probably the best way for me to do it. And, 100% it is. And it's going to allow me to be capitalized enough to get those things going and off the ground. And I, I went franchise because there's at least some sort of a playbook there, right? Like they figure some stuff out and um, yeah. And the opportunity was just right. So that's, and I can, I hadn't, I hadn't found anything on market that I wanted to buy either. So that was kind of part of piece of the puzzle. If I had found something that was like really, really made sense, um, I probably would have went down that road um, or I'd rather buy existing franchises, uh, yeah, yeah. something like that, but, or a re, you know, a franchise resale, but um but yeah, so retail mattress industry is uh, is what my next venture is. So camera guy, crime scene cleanup, retail mattress. Why Love not? It. Are so. you still looking for businesses to buy or um, are you always um, kind of looking? What's your yeah, perspective? I wasn't looking for a business to buy when I bought my second one. So yeah. um, <laughs> <laughs> I just found it and I was like, ooh, I should probably do that. So so I'm not looking, but do I look on BizBuySell all the time? Yeah. And if I find something or see something, you know, at this point, it would probably be a partnership deal or something be like, Ooh, yeah. man, this really makes sense. Let me go find somebody else that, that wants to do this deal with me. And I can put some capital in, or I can be a, yeah. I can be a partner that way. Or now 
I could potentially look at buying businesses that would be complementary to the retail mattress space, which would which would be maybe like chiropractic offices or something like referral source businesses that you know would really work yeah. well together. Um, that's smart. That's a very smart way to think about it. Yeah. So just trying to think of, and and that's what I thought of too when I was in when I was in the crime scene space. I was like, man, should I buy a there's a, a companies that do that do pickup like body pickups basically like you know they get contracted by the county to go to go pick up the bodies and trans it's body transportation basically um huge referral source for our industry right and i was like well i've owned one of those i would just get all the referrals um it wasn't that easy and i never did it um but uh but yeah that's kind of how i'm always thinking about um now, if I have an existing business, it's like, Ooh, what am I looking for now? Well, let's look to see something that's going to make sense, right? Like either complimentary service is a lot easier to do that, right? If you're a service business and you've got either repeat clients or whatever type of service industry it is a lot easier to go find another, like, well, we're already there. We could sell them this stuff if we, if we owned both of these types of companies. So those a little bit easier than, than, than the retail side, but, um, there's definitely some things that would probably make sense. Um, as far as something else to look for. So that, that, yeah. that would maybe be the only thing that I would be looking for unless something again fell in my lap or I found something that was like, ugh, too, too, too good to pass up, but I'm going all in on the mattress on the mattress deal for now. And, um, and so I'll keep, I'll keep my eyes open, but yeah, let me know if you got any good deals. <laughs> yeah. Always, always. Of course. I love that. Always looking. Um, well, Steve, thank you. Really, really appreciate your time today. And, uh, yeah. this is going to inspire so many people to, to think about at least, you know, buying a business as an option. I think a lot of people, you know, don't hear enough of these stories and sort of like the intricacies of what that process really looks like, you know, before, during, after. And, you know, I think this is going to really, um, inspire a lot of people to take action, you know? So, um, this has been great. Really, really, really appreciate your time. And, um, yeah, let's, please stay in touch. You know, hopefully we can do a deal together at some point. Yeah. Yeah. That'd be fun. Oh, thanks. Thanks for having me. Um, I've got nothing to sell or anything like that. I just like to share the story and I think it would have helped me when I was trying to, you know, push over the the ledge to, 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 to take the leap. So um, yeah, I hope it does. I hope it inspires people to, to go do it. Um, and, and a lot of cool, crazy things can happen when you're in the game and it, it doesn't matter. Buy a small deal, you know, there's nothing wrong with buying small deals. Um, partner with somebody, buy a bigger deal, whatever it is. Um, it's totally possible. I did it. And a lot of people are out there doing it 100%. So good for you. And, and, and um, thank you for, for spreading the good word and doing what you're doing with uh you know, with your stuff and, and sharing, sharing this and trying to educate other people that this is possible as well. So, um, yeah, it was fun. It was fun to chat and hopefully yeah. we'll, hopefully we'll definitely keep in touch and, uh, for sure, hopefully we'll, we'll do a deal together at some point. Yeah, absolutely. And where can people find you, you know, if they want to reach out, um, is Twitter or X now. A good yeah, place or... I'm on, I'm on Twitter and Instagram and Facebook, Twitter and Instagram, Steve Keller three is my handle. Um, I don't post a bunch, but, uh, but I'm definitely easily accessible there. So I think I'm on LinkedIn too. Um, awesome. although I don't use that all that much, but I should now, I, I think you can use it for deal flow if I'm, if I'm, uh, yeah, yeah, no, sure. totally. Yeah. Well, look, thank you again. Um, you know, I know we're at time, so really, really, really appreciate it. And please, yeah, let's stay in touch. Sounds good. Thanks, Alan. Bye Steve. Bye. Thank you.